Hello, my name is Bob Tribe, and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. Valley to Vietnam is a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 500. It is our intent to trace the arc of experience between Sacramento and Vietnam for our local Vietnam veteran veterans. Um, so our guest today is Larry Brooks. Larry, welcome. Thank and, you. And Glad thank you for here. your service. Thank you. Um, Larry served with the 9th Infantry Division uh, in 1968 and 69. And uh, so let's begin. You were born in Long Beach, California. Long Beach, California. 1948. 1948, yeah. Okay, and your parents came out to California from Minnesota and North Dakota. That w those were their, their home states. Yeah, they, uh, they met in the 30s in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, my mother was from a pretty much a poor dirt family in northern Minnesota. My father lived up in the upper reaches of North Dakota. Okay. Um, and initially they moved way up by Eureka, Fortuna. Yeah, they, they migrated out in the late 30s to, uh, to Fortuna. Uh -huh. uh, I, I have an uncle and my mother's sister, my uh, uncle worked for the Pacific Lumber Mill up there. Okay. And my father went to work uh, uh, at the same place. I toured that mill with my I wife. I did as a yeah. child myself. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. walk up above and see everything going on. and Quite a place. Everybody yeah. was whistling at my wife and <laughs> <laughs> I said, get back to work, you're going to saw your fingers off or something. So, but they didn't like the cold and the rain and no, my father complained that it made his arthritis ache or his arm yeah. ache. And, uh, they migrated in the early 40s uh, to Long Beach, okay. uh, like a lot of people from the Midwest did. And sure. There were probably more people in Long Beach at the time from Iowa and the Midwest than, than actually grew True. up there. And there was a lot of work there then during the war. Aircraft factories and uh, that sure. kind of work and automobiles. You've got four brothers and a sister. Four brothers and a sister. I have a uh, had a twin brother passed away a few years ago. Uh -huh. uh, we were the youngest, and so I had uh, we had three older brothers and an older sister. Yes. Okay. So, and three of your brothers also were in the army. Yeah, my oldest brother Dennis, uh, next oldest Dick, and the one that's two years older than than I am, uh, Dwayne, uh, all served in the army. Uh, okay. Dennis and Dick served in the uh, army security agency. Uh, in the uh, early mid '60s, uh -huh. uh, Dennis and Dick both did tours in Vietnam. Dwayne uh, was a uh, nuclear weapons technician in Germany. He used to clean bombs, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. Um, and you grew up in Paramount, which I guess is close to Long Beach. Yeah, it's kind of it's tucked between North Long Beach, Compton, and Downey in that area, Bellflower. If any people are familiar with that area, uh, tough area. Pretty tough area. Uh, yeah. We had some of the neighborhoods actually had curbs and gutters, and others didn't. You right. know, in, the, in the streets. Uh, yeah. I, I actually grew up in an M1 industrial zone, so <laughs> <laughs> it was an area, a neighborhood in transition. Okay. Say. Um, you graduated from Long Beach High School. Uh, Long Beach Jordan High School. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And then you spent a year at Compton Junior College. Compton, J Compton JC, yeah. And you promptly lost your 2S deferment when you dropped out of school. Did not sign up, uh, needed to exit the, uh, the, the house. Right. Uh, and uh, couldn't keep going to school full time and, and support myself. Right. So yeah, got, got re, uh, lost my 2S deferment and was immediately a 1A candidate for the draft. And how long did it take when you got that 1A, how long did it take you to get drafted? Well, I actually visited the draft board because I knew it was coming. And this was in uh, about June of, after I graduated high school in 66. Uh, excuse me, yeah, 60, or after I left uh, J Compton JC, excuse me, in 67. And I was told that I would be drafted around December or January of uh, 1967 or 68. Yeah. And so I knew it was coming, so I said, well, let's move it up and just draft me now. And so I ended up going in in August. Okay. So I technically volunteered for the draft, although I was, I have to say, I was a kind of a reluctant <laughs> volunteer. It's still volunteering for the draft, yeah. so that counts. Yeah. Um, and you went to basic training at Fort Ord. 
uh, near Monterey. Went up there to Fort Ord, uh, took basic there. It was uh, th at the time when they had uh, meningitis restrictions uh, oh, at right. uh, Fort Ord. I remember. And so the p each of the platoons within each of the training companies was uh, isolated from the others. So okay. it was you were basically in 50 man platoon units uh, throughout training. And meningitis was killing people. Yeah, uh, and it was fall at, in Monterey, and uh, you know, they had to keep the windows open in the barracks while we were uh, going yeah. through training. You wake up in the morning and they throw the lights on, and the barracks would be full of fog. <laughs> Turn the heaters on, and it would uh, blow the, fo the fog out of the barracks. Oh, I remember. It was There's a little the chilly the getting up. The Army had strict rules, even at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where there wasn't any meningitis. We were required to have the windows open so many inches, and it just really hit cold, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, so after Ord, you're sent, sent all the way to Fort Polk, Louisiana, for advanced, I call it infantry training, but I guess technically it's advanced individual training. But in your case, it was advanced, advanced infantry. Training. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're every, almost everybody was, uh, that was a draftee, a U.S., uh, in basic uh, was assigned, it was the time, time of, the, of uh, the war that was going on, right. uh, to infantry, to the infantry uh, training, 11 Bravo. And I was one of just a half a dozen that was uh, sent to uh, Fort Polk, uh -huh. which was uh, known infamously or famously as Tigerland. Yeah, Tigerland. The, the final training place for infantrymen for Vietnam. Right. So when you went to Tigerland, you, know, you knew where you were headed. Now, and how was, how was Tigerland AIT different from other places, do you know? Uh, since it's the only place I attended AIT, but I was told by other people that, it, uh, first of all, it was nine weeks instead of eight for, uh, for infantry AIT. Okay. Uh, and it was completely oriented toward uh, Vietnam. Uh, so right. everything was about Vietnam training. Uh -huh. It was a really difficult training. Uh, I had hoped, actually, when I got to uh, to AIT that it would be a little bit of a break from basic training, uh, but it was actually, I, th I call it basic training on steroids. Right. Uh, we slept four and a half, five hours a night if we were lucky. Yeah. And uh, the training was uh, pretty intense and uh, it was difficult, it was, a, it was a rough place to be. Sure. I guess it was sort of an experiment in, let's get them as close to the kind of conditions they're going to be in in Vietnam as, and not just you know, classroom and going out to the fire range and spend a lot of time. So. Yeah, and virtually every uh, uh, drill instructor uh, and uh, all of the commanders, staff, field commanders, were Vietnam veterans, recent right. Vietnam veterans. So you, you learned about Vietnam from people who had been there. That was, I always say, a benefit. I remember when I was going through, I can't remember if it was basic or AIT, the instructor would say to us sometimes, okay, look to your right, or look to your left, one of you is going to be killed in Vietnam. <laughs> I'm thinking, gee, I don't know that the odds are that bad. And I used to tell these guys, well, it's probably going to be one of you because it's not going to be me. Okay, but yeah, yeah they they kind of hammered you with that over and over again. It was funny when we graduated. Uh, they actually brought the company into uh, the the chaplains had a sort of a, a meeting at the at the chapel, the local chapel, and the chaplain gave us talk to everybody and says, you know, uh, five percent of you the odds are are not going to be returning from their tours in Vietnam. Now, if, I, if, if I'd, I'd have taken 5% percent <laughs> any time, because yeah, really. it was a lot worse than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, when you take, you know, maybe they meant 5% of the Army, but, you know, when, yeah. when you've got 10 people in support for every infantryman, you know, yeah. those, those support people aren't going to be killed, generally. Um, but, yeah, if you're a 11B, 11 Bravo, Rifleman, your chances go way up, and then it depends on who you're assigned to and yeah. how competent your your leaders are, and all those sort of things. A lot of variables. Yeah. yeah. So um, you got a 30-day leave back to Long Beach before mm -hmm. you head to Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, then did you try to cram in all the good stuff into those 30 days? You know, I got, I I look back and it's, it's kind of a blur. <laughs> I, you know. It went by too fast. I suppose I had a couple of beers. I don't yeah. remember, but you know, tried to relax. Right. It was like, what could you do? I know that's that's a big thing hanging in front it's of you. It's a, it's there. So you flew to Tonsonut Air Base in Vietnam, and you arrived uh, 
8th of February, 1968. Yeah, uh, but before we did that, we went to, you know, we reported to the Oakland Army Base. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, that was, Oakland Army Base was a warehouse with bunk beds. Right. And they had uh, TV sets and everybody would sit around, waiting around for a day or two, getting processed, smoking cigarettes and drinking Cokes and waiting to get to go. Yeah. Uh, with the t on the TVs, the TV news was there was something going on in Vietnam called the Tet. 1968 offensive. Yeah, that's February. And so we were uh, <coughs> we were kind of keenly tuned to the, to the news while yeah. we were there, but yeah. Well then we 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 went we rushed to Travis and we flew over and I landed in in country on the 8th of February. Oh boy, yeah, because I think officially Tet started the 31st of January. So yeah, February was really the heart of it. Yeah. Um. So you get to the air base and they put you on buses. Yeah, they when we flew into country, they actually divert, diverted us from Benoit Air Force Base right. to uh, Tonsonut uh, Airport in, right in Saigon because of artillery. There was conflicts with artillery going on right. around Benoit at the time. So we, f we landed at uh, Tonsonut. The airport was virtually deserted uh, except for patrolling infantry troops from, the, uh -huh. from uh, um, the American infantry. Right. Uh, right at the tail end of, of Tet, it seemed like the whole city was still smoking. But yeah, they put us on bus buses and uh, convoy of three or four buses and and whisked us off to uh, to Long Bin with had gun jeeps in front of us and rear and a Huey helicopter gunship flying escort above the buses as we right. rolled through Saigon and out to Long Bin. And probably mesh on the windows so nobody could throw a hand grenade into the buses. And I remember the mesh. It was thick yeah. mesh. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so you get to you get to Long Bin and hear all these people there. How many hundreds or there were hundreds? I don't yeah. know uh, what the exact number, but it was in excess of 400 people that arrived. I mean, the the training units in the states were pouring out 11 Bravos, and they were all coming over at that yeah. time. Uh, so there was at least 400, and we were at Long Bin. You're issued your jungle fatigues and your basic. Uh, uh, clothing that you're going to wear, uh -huh. and then they had us in a formation, and they had a, uh, I believe it was a staff sergeant with a bullhorn in front, uh -huh. and uh, he had a clipboard and was and uh, he would read off names, and each name was each was assigned to a different unit in Vietnam. He'd be the 25th division, the fourth, the first, or the 101st, or whatever, yeah. uh, ninth, right, uh, whatever unit it was. So you could be parceled out to any unit. Just by happenstance, and it was uh, interesting. There was a while this was happening. We're standing, uh, trying to listen to this guy, for listen to our names, so we know where we're going. And there was a chap on the side of the of the formation, sitting at a picnic table, in old uh, weathered jungle fatigue. So he'd been in country obviously a while. Nobody was paying any attention to him, but he had a big bro box, and he and he sat it down there. And as soon as the as the staff sergeant started reading names, he turned this thing up as loud as it would go. And he played uh, "Light My Fire" by The Doors <laughs> for 23 minutes <laughs> oh, while we were standing. And there. the sergeant didn't stop him. Nobody or stopped him. They yeah. just left him alone. Oh, jeez. I thought this is different. <laughs> this isn't like training. <laughs> no. No. Um, so you're assigned to the Ninth Infantry, and uh, you're going to be assigned to Tan Tru, which is in the Delta. Yes. In. Uh, um, so you are helicoptered there, or how do you get there? Trucks? Uh, they threw us in a deuce and a half. Uh, okay. I say, as I recall, there may be 30 or 40 of us that were assigned to the 9th out of that uh, that day. Uh -huh. And they drove us to Bearcat, which was still the division base camp prior to it moving uh, a few months later down to Dong Tam near Mito in the Delta. Uh -huh. But they took us up to Bearcat, uh, which was the 9th division base camp. And there we were cut orders for different units. So we were parceled out. So there were s fewer and fewer of us. Right. Uh, four of us uh, out of that group were assigned to the Second Battalion, 60th Infantry, which was at Tan Tru, uh -huh. and we uh, caught a deuce and a half to Tan An, which was the closest uh, town to, to Tan Tru. Uh -huh. And at Tan Tru, uh, they says, "Wait, somebody will come along, and, uh, and we'll be heading there uh, on the way." And uh, an hour later or so, uh, a lieutenant. Great guy turned out to be by the name of Lieutenant Sergeant, S A R G E N T. 
um, and uh, an enlisted guy that was with him were uh, in a jeep heading towards Tan Shu, which was about 12 clicks kilometers down a dirt road from Tan An. Right. So the four of us that were assigned that day hopped in the jeep and got on and were riding down the road. I remember Lieutenant Sergeant, uh, we all had newly issued M16s with no ammo, no clips, nothing. Right. And he asked us if we had ammunition, and we said no. And so he handed each one of us four clips. Okay. <laughs> said here, <laughs> just in lock case. It, lock it and load, keep it on safe. So yeah. that was that wow. was the first time That's we actually it. had uh -oh. bullets. And then you're starting to look uh, on both sides of you as you're going down the road or yeah. whatever. Yeah, riding down the road yeah. and we rode into Tantrum. Ambushes were pretty day. common. So um, you get to Tantru in mid-February. Yep. After only being in country probably, you know, less than a week or so. And right away, you're going out in the field, right? Right-o. Yep. Yeah. Um, so now... You're carrying 17 magazines for your M16, plus you're carrying extra machine gun ammunition for the M60 machine guns. That's right. Yeah, I was assigned, I'm a pretty big guy, and I was assigned as a uh, assistant uh, ammo bearer, assistant gunner to the squad's uh -huh. uh, machine gun, M60 machine gunner, a guy by the name of John Clary, from great guy from Cleveland, uh, right. Ohio. Um, and so I was uh, sort of, my job was to uh, carry extra ammunition and stay with the uh, machine gunner. Uh -huh. When we got into contact, I had to go run around, scramble around and get the rest of the ammo from the folks in the squad and right. make sure the belt was fed with ammunition. So I carried 300 rounds myself plus an M16 and about 17 magazines as much as I would yeah. wanted to, but I right. felt I could carry out there. Jeez. You told me one story that we didn't talk about earlier, but about you were, I think you were on a listening post or you're at some sort of outpost and, and there were a couple of guys there that had been there ahead of you. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, they didn't know <laughs> how to fire the M60, I guess, or yeah. how to load it. Yeah, my first night in Tantru, uh, you were, they were supposed to give you 72 hours, they said, bef to acclimate before you went out with the unit. Yeah. It turned out to be 24, but that's close enough. Right? <laughs> But I was uh, uh, put on bunker guard duty, uh, okay. uh, and it was just a sandbag bunker uh, at Tan Tru at the battalion base camp. And uh, you had four people manning it, and uh, three people would sleep, and one guy would be awake for an hour, and that's you'd alternate it. Hopefully. So I'm there, and I'm with these three guys. I don't know them because I'm brand new, and I've got uh, um, you know brand new fatigues on. These guys have weathered, faded fatigues on. I figured, well, they've been here in country yeah. for a while. They're old salts. About two o'clock in the morning, or 200 hours, as they call it, uh, we get a call uh, on the radio that uh, one of the listening posts out in front of us thought there might be some movement, and they there was an M16 that was tripod M60 tr uh, mounted on a tripod in this right. bunker, and they said uh, fire about 100 rounds out just to see if uh, you get any kind of reaction out there. Yeah, and so these guys are all. We're cranking and working on this M uh, M60 machine gun, and finally, after about five minutes, they kind of turned to me and they <laughs> said, "Do you know how to shoot this thing?" <laughs> they weren't they weren't one one beast. They weren't infantrymen. They were cooks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I had to go. The new guy had to go and show him how to and open it up and yeah. throw some rounds out there. I guess that was the first time I actually fired. I thought about it, forgot about that. Yeah. Fired around in in Vietnam. Sure. But you're you're going out on on uh, operations um, like immediately and out in the field and you know uh, yeah the routine was uh, it was it was nonstop seven days a week you, you we would pull operation company size operations uh, during the day at night you either pulled a tw were part of a twelve man ambush patrol that went two or three clicks out right and to set up. Or else you were on a four four person listening post. Uh -huh. If you were lucky, you got bunker guard duty, and so you did operations with the company during the day, mm -hmm. uh, th th those kinds of duties at night, and then it just went on and on seven days a week with nonstop. So and you never got enough sleep. Never got enough sleep. No. Right. But, and you're always sleeping on the ground someplace. So within about two weeks of of arriving with your unit, 
you end up in a big firefight, first of March. Yeah, we were out, we were the, the company was out. I think the entire battalion was out. At least a couple of companies were out at this place called village called On Uton, which was uh, I don't know, could have been ten clicks or so from from Cantru. I was never sure. We they flew us out there. Right. And we pulled an operation where the company went out on on foot, uh, and it was a long area known as the bowling alley. People that have served in the, that area know the bowling alley. It's, it's an area that's well known. And we were uh, out there. We were spread out. And we went out on foot, and uh, we probably went out about uh, five clicks altogether. But when we were about three clicks out on the bowling alley, there were a couple of guys in front of me that were walking the dike, which we didn't do. Uh, unless you were crazy, I thought. So we were rocking the paddy, and these two guys were maybe 150 feet in front of me. All of a sudden, I'm just looking up, and boom! Two guys get I get blown off the dike and into the into the rice paddy. It turned out they were uh, not terribly badly wounded because they these they were booby trapped grenades that were buried in the dike. Oh, it was okay. dry season. And yeah. it, and it uh, absorbed a lot of the impact. So the, both of them had shrapnel and were dusted off. So we stopped for a minute and did that, and uh, we continued on in. And when we finally got in, in at the end of the bowling alley, there was a river and a clearing. And uh, there was, going in, into this wooded area next to the river, I happened to see uh, a couple of, a pair of flip-flops stuck in the mud, and then uh, uh, footprints leading in. So they were fresh. Uh -huh. So I informed my uh, my platoon sergeant. I said, "Looks like somebody's in there," and he said, uh, "Yeah, Brooks." He says, "I want you to go in there and check it out." <laughs> that was my. <laughs> I, I looked at him. I said, "Sergeant Clark, yeah. I'm not going to do that." Yeah. <laughs> and he says, "You know, I don't." He says, "You're not really as crazy as I thought you were, <laughs> after all." You and he know. say, "How about recon by fire?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> much preferred. Yeah. As it turned out, our squad leader, uh, Sergeant Holloway, which is a great guy from a uh, little town called Gobbler's Knob, Georgia, <laughs> great. said, I'm going to go in there and get that SOB. Yeah. And he walked in there, and no, no more than two minutes, three minutes later, he's firing uh, toward the river away from us, pull, uh, pulling off some shots. And then he comes running out uh, that wooded area, and he's got an AK-47 in his hand, and he said, the little son of a Jumped, jumped <laughs> in the river, <laughs> and so uh, we threw a couple of grenades in there, and the guy was gone. Uh -huh. So we we pursued it to our left, and and uh, there was a, a wood line, probably a two hundred fifty feet, three hundred feet to our to our front, maybe two hundred fifty feet to our front, and all of a sudden we were taking fire. We started taking fire, and so we got down behind a dike, and I dutifully snapped on Clary's. M60 and got him going, and I was pulling a few rounds off, and uh -huh. everybody was shooting it out, and it stopped after a few minutes, and everybody lights up a cigarette and takes a, a pull off the canteen, and we brought some artillery fire in on the wood line, uh -huh. uh, and then they said, let's go up and clear it. So we got up and online, and we walked in there, and we walked into the wood line, found absolutely nothing. Turned out the wood line was only about 40 feet deep, and uh -huh. it opened up on another rice paddy on the other side. So we walked through it, walked into the open paddy, and about the first dike we came to, which probably another 250 feet, 200 feet, there's a, a, a squad and a platoon from our Alpha Company down behind the dike. And we said, well, we looked down, what are you guys doing here? Just no quicker we said that than we got opened up on automatic weapons right from behind us from the, from the, uh, from the tree line. Tree line we just walked through. Oh, wow. And so, so they were well hidden in there somehow. Yeah, we hadn't. We couldn't see any bunkers. We couldn't see anything in there. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it was uh, quite a firefight, and uh, it went on for for quite a while. And our uh, company commander, I never didn't even know him. I hadn't been there long enough. Who was a first lieutenant, was mortally wounded. Took a round in the neck, and uh, they dusted him off. And um, Finally, they before we, we went back in to clear uh, the area again, they d they just called up on the radios and said, "Let's back off into it." There was an open uh, rice paddy behind us, and they said, uh, <coughs> "Move out there, and we'll bring in the, the helicopters and get you out of there." Yeah. So we um, uh, Alpha Company went first, and as we're getting ready to to go, 
uh, we see that they had a, we had another KIA, and he was a guy from Alpha Company that we didn't know uh -huh. that was still there. So sure. we had to carry him out of there and, and uh, get him. A bunch of us took kind of turns and uh, hauling him out of there and, and, and back on the helicopters. And were there several wounded in addition to that? Uh, I never, yeah, there were some people wounded. I was so new, though, I'm not sure who they were, but there were right. a, a number of wounded, and, and the, the, the CO was, was killed that day. Now, you said most of these, when you were inserted in helicopters, you made as many as eight insertions in one day on some occasions. One day we made eight. Generally, we would make four or five, sometimes six, <laughs> but we did, we did eight in one day. Four or five average, though, is still a lot. Oh, yeah. We had yeah. helicopter assets, and they would take us out and, and drop us into the, the insertion area next to the wood line. We'd get out and, and uh, get online, organize ourselves, and, and uh, probe and get into the wood line. And generally, we'd find enemy bunkers and maybe some weapons <coughs> and, and then uh, clear it, come out, and get picked up, and go do it again someplace else. A lot of these helicopters were taking rounds as they were trying to land and yeah. uh, upon landing and yeah, we would get pot shots. Some of the uh, we had we had hot LZs on occasion. Uh, most of the time we would come in without uh, taking with that wouldn't be hot. Right. But uh, you we had occasionally, you know, probably once every once a week or so we'd had one that was, that was fairly hot that we were taking rounds coming in. And you were wounded on one of those. Uh, insertions. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I was still very pretty new in the company. It was on 31st of March, and uh, we were operating out of a place out of Highway 4 called the Pink Palace, which is a uh, sort of a temporary base camp that the battalion took up uh -huh. uh, down near Mito and a little deeper into the Delta. And we went out on five ships uh, that day uh, instead of a, the normal lift of 10. I don't know if we, uh, if it was just we just that's all the air assets we had. And my squad in the third platoon was assigned the, the lead ship that day, so uh, we went up and uh, we, we were come, we were flying around, and basically the way we, the, the insertions would go is we would go up to 2,500 feet and uh, fly around. We knew that the enemy down there could see us if we were if, as we were flying around, but they would at one point. Uh, just sort of turn to where the, the point where they were going and speed up a little bit and just start moving down. So it was four or five minutes when that uh, we started to move that we would be on the ground. Uh -huh. uh, and w we were in the lead ship. We just we uh, we was we came in. Uh, Huey was was tilted back and, and preparing to land, and we were m no more than 25, 30 feet off the ground. And we started taking heavy fire from uh, from the front. Right through the bottom right of the helicopter. Through the bottom of the helicopter. Yeah. So the helicopter that, uh, that, that we were in <coughs> uh, basically almost went, flew, was flying vertical as we were taking rounds uh, through the bottom of it. And I happened to be sitting on the middle seat. And as I was sitting there with my M16 and my, between my legs, waiting to, for us to land, I could, the, the VC had used green tracers a lot of times. So you, you, there were green tracers that were coming right up through the floor <laughs> and out the top of the helicopter wow. were coming down. Mm -hmm. And I was hit by a, a ricochet. Uh, so I don't know what it hit before it hit me, but uh -huh. I, was, I was stung in the, uh, right here, just below my eye. Uh, of course, the first, my first thought was, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just been shot in the head. And you probably bled a lot. <laughs> bled, yeah, I was bleeding. You know, those facial oh, injuries, yeah. basically, I was bleeding right. pretty good. But uh, as it turns out, uh, the helicopter landed Shortly after we, we got out of there, and just shortly after we, we got out, the enemy broke off contact. Uh -huh. And um, I was, our platoon medic treated me and put me on the next lift, the closest helicopter on the second lift that was coming in behind us, and they flew me out of there. Uh -huh. And they patched you up, and you were back out in the field the very next day. Yeah, I was, uh, they flew me to Dongtam, and, and uh, as we were coming into the third surge hospital at Dongtam, uh, I'll never forget it. We flew over the large base camp, and there was a swimming pool down below where a lot of GIs were taking a, uh, a swim. Uh -huh. And I could hear the Beach Boys music off of the row box as we were coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, <laughs> I've really got a crappy MOS. You know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah, why couldn't I be a <laughs> supply guy or something? Um. So I was taken in, and uh, I was stitched up, and. Um, Given a tetanus shot, and 
and then spent the night at Dongtam and, and trucked back out to the Pink Palace the next day and was back in, back in the field. Wow. You, uh, so that, that period from, from really February to June, you're just uh, in daily action, really. Yeah, constant operations, yeah. 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 And then in June, you get a special assignment. Yeah, it was a really strange day. We were out at uh, in the Plain of Reeds, which is a, out in the Parrot's Beak, northwest of Saigon, right. operating out of a special forces place. And I hated the place because there were no dikes out there. And there uh -huh. was dikes were our salvation right. in the Delta. Uh, and we, we came in, uh, we did an ambush patrol that on the night of the 31st came in, and I had a, something was going on with my stomach, and we, I had some breakfast and, and threw it up. and. Uh, our fr our uh, tin sergeant told me to stay back because uh, they were, we were going out on, on eagle flighting that day. Stay back and uh, see how you're feeling this afternoon. I said, all right. And uh, squad flew out. Uh, first time I had I'd ever missed a day in the field, actually. It was really in incredible, uncanny. Uh, went out and within 10 minutes later, we were listening, monitoring the insertion over the radios and it was a hot landing zone and there were casualties and uh, five minutes later helicopters returned and as they came in they were carrying two of my squad mates off of the helicopter they were both w uh, never made it out alive out of the helicopter well one did uh, mm -hmm. one guy did but the other guy my assistant gunner yeah. was killed this is your assistant gunner is your uh, m60 machine gunner and he's the assistant gunner. yeah 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 he's a great guy navajo uh, indian by the name of Annette city um from gallup new mexico so we lost him and we lost another guy, Oscar Phillips, that day as well. Yeah. And uh, at that afternoon, we're sitting around cleaning weapons and uh, I, there's a call comes over the radio and, they, and uh, they, my platoon sergeant said, go see the captain. I walked up to the captain and I said, what's going on? And he said, pack up your gear, you're going to the States on body escort duty. And I said, well, I didn't even know what that was. Right. I'm going to the States? It was like, this is surreal. You know. right. I had five minutes to grab my gear and get on the resupply helicopter and, and uh, uh, went in and spent the night at the Pink Palace and got into division base camp the following day and reported the grave registration where I was informed that I was going on body escort duty for a kid named by the name of Danny Powell who uh, was my next door neighbor and actually grew up uh, with me and my brothers and was basically like a brother. Yeah. Who volunteered for the draft when I was going in so he could go in with me. And the Army normally doesn't arrange this, but Danny's mother insisted that you yeah. bring him back, right? Yeah. Uh, his, uh, when they came to her door and informed her that, that Danny had, uh, had died, she said, well, uh, Larry Brooks is coming back with him. She said, well, we can't do that. He's not next to Ken. She says, we'll see about that. So she called the congressman and the and the commanding general at uh, Fort MacArthur in Los Angeles, and That'll do it. somehow things got done, and they yeah. said, "Okay, well, we'll send him, send him as a body escort." So I, I was on my way back to the states two days later. How how long were you back in the states? Um, I was about oh, I think it was about ten days total, uh -huh. maybe twelve. I, I'm not sure. Right. But I came in, and it was a it was it was a very weird time. A, we actually learned, I, was, I flew home with a bunch of regular people that were flying home, f completing their tours. Uh -huh. And it was uh, when um, Robert Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles. Right. And we heard about that he had been wounded when we made a gasoline stop or fuel stop uh -huh. halfway back and nobody knew what was going on. And then we found out that Kennedy was killed at the same time. Yeah. T it turned out that uh, Danny's funeral was on the, basically on the same day all that business was going on with uh, with the Robert Kennedy uh, the aftermath of that right so it was a real strange time in the United States as, as, as it was for me and after being you know out in the field just about every day that you had been over there so far you're sort of thinking do I really want to go back no I was just like I was back in uh, in the world as we called it yeah and just I would just flush the toilet and and just watch the water f swirl and think, wow, you know, it's really amazing. Flush toilets are really <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. 
kind of showers. <laughs> the real, showers. Real hot showers. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a different thing. Yeah, nobody shitting at me. Yeah, it was a difficult time. And it was uh, also an eye opener just in terms of what was going on and how people were reacting to soldiers. Sure. Uh, yeah, it, it really changed in a couple of years. And there were so many protests. And this is times when guys were getting spit on and all that. Yeah. So. So anyway, I, I finally mustered it up, mustered it up, and said I got to go back. First of all, I, I knew I had to go back because I had, you know, brothers in Charlie Company in my platoon that yeah. that uh, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't. So right. Reluctantly, I got back on a plane and flew back to Vietnam. But you were six six days late reporting to your unit. For some, uh, somehow I, I didn't really make it back as quickly as I perhaps could have. <laughs> so I can understand. Uh -huh. So I took, a, I took an extra six days. As yeah. a matter of fact, when I walked into the platoon, when I got back to Tantru, my first sergeant asked me where I had been, and I looked up at the board on behind the counter, and I saw my name was under the letters A-W-O-L. Oh. So I said, well, Tom, I, I've been AWOL. <laughs> Just yeah. Okay, get your stuff. Right. <laughs> oh boy. So, so you forced uh, you got a, probably an Article 15 or something like that, some sort of. Yeah, I got an Article 15. They called me in a week or two later, and and I, uh, into the EXO's office, at, and they fined me sixty bucks and bust, busted me back to PFC. Oh jeez. Right for. Yeah. It so was worth the six days. Yeah. No kidding. I mean, what are they going to do, send you to <laughs> Vietnam, as exactly. they used to say? <laughs> yeah. So, um, now, did you ever get out of the field while you were in Vietnam? No, I was back in, I was back in the field, and uh, I was uh, just kind of took it upon myself to really take the new guys under, under my wing and try to talk to them about the, the best ways they could survive uh, yeah. being out there. And that didn't mean doing everything that you were told to do. We meant thinking for yourself and try doing, trying your best to make it through. But we took a lot of casualties in, in uh, Charlie Company. The year I was in Charlie Company, uh, we probably had a field strength of maybe 75, 80 at the most, and oftentimes less than that. And we had uh, we took uh, we lost 28 killed in action during the t my my time in your with Charlie Company. In my in your company, company, yeah. That's really bad odds. Yeah. Uh, and how many people were in your company? Did you say what was the general? Well, strength? we basically had to get sixty to 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 fill to get ten people, uh, you know, ten lifts, fill up ten helicopters. Right. But you'd have people on R and R, so you had seventy, maybe seventy-five, eighty, maybe yeah. max. Uh, right. With uh, in the company, but you, you know, you had people being wounded and people being killed sure. and and new pla replacements coming in the yeah. whole time. But I I stayed in the field until. Um, November, um, about the mid part of November, when they finally uh, assigned me, gave me a job off the line as a uh, manning a, a radar lookout tower uh, that was in that's in Tantru. Yeah, and I stayed on that doing that for about only about two weeks, and uh, then I had orders that came down, and I was uh, TDY'd to an artillery unit, first to the eleventh artillery. I had less than 60 days to go in country. Yeah. And I found out a few days later that they actually took a lot of guys that came over and had about that much time left out of, uh, there were 11 Bravos, and they assigned them to backfill some positions in artillery units, give okay. them a break and also help out the sure. shortage in the artillery units. Yeah. And then finally you leave Vietnam the 3rd of February of 1969. Yep. And Reported, uh, I was supposed to leave the 8th, that was my d -Rose. Uh -huh. uh, and I was I reported the, like on the fourth uh, or the third, which is five days before my deros to division. Uh -huh. and I get there and they said we've been trying to get a hold of you. You're leaving tomorrow. Your 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 flight is the fourth. They okay. moved you up, so they rushed me through everything, and I had to get back to Tantru to turn in my gear and um, and do do one survive one last night in Tantru before I got out of there. And then you end up back at Fort Ord. Got assigned to uh, to Fort Ord, back to Fort Ord. So some spooky kind of thing that was going on there. The uh, you said it was the Combat Developments Experimentation Command or something. Yeah, uh, Litton Industries at the time had 
had signs all over the place. But this unit was called CDEC. It was Combat Developments Experimentation Command, something like that, some yeah. kind of gobbledygook. Uh, where they would take us out, out of Fort Ord and drive us down uh, in trucks uh, to uh, Hunter Liggett Military Reservation, sure. down about a hundred miles south or whatever it was. And they would march us around in the, out in the uh, hills there and have us walk by sensors that were dropped from helicopters onto the ground to, yeah. to see if they could pick up and, and there was some tool that they were trying to use for the infantry at the time. Right. Yeah, we, we dealt with some of those in Florida when we were out in the field for a few weeks in the swamps, you know, where they're dropping these things like little mini mine kind of things and stuff, yeah, all kinds of different things. They look like little fake bushes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I remember we they wa we walked by them and they'd say, "Well, it did, we didn't pick us up. Walk by them again, and this time stomp your feet as you go by." <laughs> <laughs> okay, that kind of stuff. So when did you actually leave the service then? I uh, got an early out to go to school. I signed up to go to junior college at Cerritos co College in uh -huh. uh, Norwalk, and I s got accepted uh, there. And so uh, it it was on the 11th of June of uh, '69. Okay, I got out. I was separated. And then you the transferred year. to Chico State from there, or? What? Yeah, I went, to, I finished, I did a year at uh, Cerritos, and then I uh, was a uh, junior, and as a junior, I did a semester at uh, Long Beach State. Uh -huh. And pr after a uh, semester there, I transferred up to uh, Chico State. So really, since, since 1970, except for a little side trip to Fort Bragg for a year or so, you've been in the Sacramento Valley since since 1970. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Uh, from Butte County to, to uh, Yuba Sutter to Sacramento. And you got a degree in public administration from Chico State and right away you get hired by Butte County? I worked at Butte County as a, in the planning department uh, uh -huh. as a young planner there and, and uh, uh, worked there for about five years and uh, worked for the newly incorporated town of Paradise as a city planner there. Okay. Uh, moved around, went to Fort Bragg, and ended up at uh, at uh, Yuba County as the county planning director there. Where I was uh, had I spent ten years there. Picked up my master's degree, but I went back to Chico and uh, during that time. Okay, is that was that Marysville or Yuba City then? Uh, Marysville, yeah, yeah. Yuba County. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because they're right next to each other, Yuba and Sutter. Right? Yeah, Yuba City's in Sutter County, and Marysville's in Yuba County. Uh, yeah, Very know. confusing. Uh, it is. Um, so um, you've been doing kind of planning work since then, and now you're pretty much retired. Yeah, I uh, was in planning for a, a few years after that. Uh, I finally left that, that field and went to work uh, with a brother who operated an industrial supply business selling uh, materials to the state, uh -huh. uh, Brooks Company up in Auburn. Okay. And uh, they, uh, uh, it's a disabled veteran-owned company. Uh -huh. and, uh, so I spent a couple of years doing that, and then I got involved with the California Disabled Veteran Alliance and served on the board and as president for a couple of years okay. before I, uh, I retired. And you're living here in Sacramento now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Larry, I'd just like to say thanks for your service. And Thank you. That was some hellacious Did I service. Did my book? Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? The, well, basically what I've been uh, talking about, I wrote, I wrote a book as kind of a catharsis. Uh, to get it out of my system, and it right. was, it's a memoir of, of all the things we've been talking about. And uh, well my relatives liked it and convinced me to to uh, put it in book form, and so here it is. So this is Tan True by Larry Brooks, and you can purchase this uh, through what publishing company? Uh, it's on on demand, books on demand. It, uh, it's available through Expresso Books. Okay. You can also get it uh, if somebody's interested in it by contacting Brooks Company. It's at I think they've got. Uh, P.O. Box 5697 in Auburn, California. Okay. 5697. And Great. Zip is 95604. Well, terrific. Track I'm glad you did that. Well, this concludes our time on Valley of Vietnam. I'd like to thank Larry for his service and say welcome home. Uh, to him and all our vets, I say the same. Uh, for Valley of Vietnam, uh, producer Jerry Ward, director James Scott, I'm Bob Tribe, and we will see you next time.